So, uh, first of all, I thought it was helpful just to look at the landscape. John's obviously already done uh, bits of this, and I'm sure you've had that uh, this morning as well. But from a lawyer's point of view, what we're seeing at the moment is obviously personal data has a value, and that value is probably increasing, particularly in terms of the value if data is stolen, but also the detriment if it's stolen to the people who did own it as well. There are different political reactions around the world. Most civilized countries have some sort of data breach notification laws. Generally speaking, in most countries, the government loses a big pot of data and it regulates the private sector as a result. And you see that pattern almost everywhere around the world. You know, you can look at the VA breach in the US, for example, HMRC breach in, in the UK or whatever. Um, as a very general rule, Europe's tended to have preventative laws, so saying you will stop data breaches happening. We'll talk about the Data Protection Act in a minute. And the US has tended to have data breach laws that are reactive. So when a breach happens, you will tell us. But that distinction is merging. We've seen thou shalt not have a breach laws in the US, in states like Massachusetts, parts of California, but we're also seeing increasingly data breach notification provisions in Europe, in places like Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, and soon to be GDPR as well. So there's that difference appro different approach between the US and Europe, but that's definitely changing. I think the other real catalyst for change has been the Snowden allegations and the work of, uh, of Max Schrems. Um, I was, uh, everyone followed the Schrems case? Do people need a, everyone? One person hasn't, so I will speak to you afterwards about it. Um, so, so if you talk to people like, I, I was speaking to Max Schrems uh, last week, and he was saying, um, I'm paraphrasing, that he was feeling a bit stressed because he had a lot of work on at the moment. And you think, if you speak to any multinational, I'm sure that they'll feel similarly, that all the challenges over data transfer and, and, and the Schrems case have hit most multinationals. And they're also, if you have operations in mainland Europe, they're also very uh, impactful on what you do as well. And what I'll talk about in a minute is whilst GDPR looks to be a sea change, I don't think it is, and some aspects of GDPR are already law in some jurisdictions. So first of all, let's just take a step back, almost look outside at what the current legislation is. Well, the current legislation, this is from uh, the Data Protection Act, uh, Principle 7, the current legislation already makes us keep data secure and says that we'll take appropriate technical and organizational measures to protect that data. It doesn't say things like, if you can find the time to do it. It doesn't say things like, if you're given the budget to do it. It's an absolute requirement, always judged in hindsight as to whether a breach could have been prevented. And some jurisdictions have gone further than that to say, as well as having plans to deal with data breaches, as well as having measures in place to make data secure, you have to rehearse these things as well. A bit like fire drills. If you're staying in a hotel, you have the fire notice on the back of the door. Most good data breach plans aim towards doing that. From personal experience, whenever you're involved in a data breach, there's a horrible, horrible culture in the room. I don't think I've ever, uh, apologies to anybody who's a client, uh, I don't see anyone, but I've never seen a nice atmosphere in a room de dealing with a data breach. There's a real blame culture. I think statistically, uh, two, three, four, five people get sacked after every data breach. Everyone in the room knows it. They would rather it wasn't them. Uh, and you get this horrible blame culture. Meantime, you might have a non-executive director who might be uh, certainly not a digital native, let's put that politely. One of the oldest people in the organization who's in charge of the technology response and in charge of the legal response. Or you'll get cases like the Talk Talk case, the appeal of which was public uh, last week, when it seems as if the interface with the regulators was just left to the CISO to manage. Why the legal team didn't do that, I, I do not know. 
But in any event, you've got to rehearse these plans just as you rehearse fire drills. Have a data breach plan, rehearse it, learn from it, improve it. So what does GDPR say that changes that? Well, basically, if you like, those are the foundations GDPR builds on top. As I said, it's 88 pages long. It's very hard to grasp exactly everything that it says. So I've tried to split some of those provisions into simple A, B, C. This isn't exhaustive. There's more in GDPR. I'm sure uh, Naira and other people are going to talk about more of that this afternoon. But here's my highlights, if you like. So under A, what are the aims of GDPR? Well, firstly, it's a proposed regulation, not a directive. What that means is that, theoretically, there should be one law for the whole of Europe, and it should be easier to interpret, because all of the EU will fall under the GDPR scheme, so will the EEA, Switzerland will probably follow. It introduces something called data protection by design, data protection by default. So what we're saying is that whenever you have a new application or a new vendor, then you should design data protection into that new operation. There's a real opportunity for those who are in security here to get involved in that process. From my experience, this whole data protection impact assessment is something that organizations can either embrace or resist. If they resist it, they're likely to get trouble not only with their uh, operations, but also with their regulators. So embrace the process. And if you're the CISO particularly, make sure you have a seat at that table when you're looking at how you're going to design these processes. I could give, if I had more time, a number of examples that we've seen already where we've had clients go through the DPIA process and pick up other risks that aren't really privacy risks, but are fundamental risks to the business as a result of doing that. Suppliers outside of the EU are in scope. Now, if you're with a U.S. organization, obviously you're going to have to comply with GDPR now as well. If you're not with a U.S. organization, but you outsource stuff to PeopleSoft or travel management or whoever that might be, look closely at those contracts with vendors. As part of Privacy Shield Safe Harbor changes, a lot of them have subtly been trying to shift responsibility onto customers. You'll need to be aware of that and resist those contractual changes. <coughs> There'll be toughened uh, enforcement bodies under GDPR. Now, one of the great myths that we see, I've seen it in a number of articles from law firms as well who should know better, is about a centralized Brussels-based data police. Nonsense. It doesn't exist. Enforcement is still done by the local authority, the uh, ICO in our case, but there will be coordination into a Brussels body in certain circumstances. But your main regulator, if you're a UK business, is still going to be the ICO. And then one of the really tough things, I think, for businesses is breach reporting in 72 hours. So as a show of hands, who thinks they could do a breach report in 72 hours? Well, and, and that's a great point as well, I think. Um, we've seen that the ICO is setting the bar pretty high in the Talk Talk uh, breach, which was the appeal uh, decision was out last week. Um, and I think you're right. I mean, in some circumstances, it's premature to report in 72 hours. And in some respects, I would rather, having been in the room when people were assessing their priorities, I'd probably rather they were stopping the breach happening and stopping the consequences rather than reporting it. That's a representation I made to the European Commission as part of the consultation process, and I was ignored, so we'll see how that works out. Um, what are the benefits then? Well, you'll see for most of them, I've put question marks. I'm not convinced there are some huge benefits with GDPR, but here we go. There's no general registration requirements. So that's £35, that's £500. You currently pay the ICO. You won't have to pay after May 2018. Brexit depending, that's the other thing uh, to think about here. One-stop shop. So theoretically, if you're a UK business, you should be dealing with the ICO for all of your European operations. So if you have a breach, theoretically, the ICO will be your lead regulator. But again, the devil will be in the detail there. Consent is less of an option. If you rely on that to handle data, now is the time to revisit that. There are new rights, like the right to be forgotten, the right to data portability. 
If you're an insurer, for example, things like the right to portability could be quite impactful. Are you able to get somebody's records very quickly and move them to a new insurer, for example? Because that's what the law may require you to do. And equally, can you get hold of all the touch points an individual has had with your organisation and destroy those records? Because that's what the right to be forgotten may ask you to do. And, and obviously, we're already seeing right to be forgotten requests from particularly unsavory individuals asking that their details be destroyed. We're also seeing an enhanced subject access regime. So how many people are dealing with subject access requests at the moment? About 25% then, maybe. So statistically, the ICO says that more than 10 million subject access requests have now been made in the UK. That's obviously a lot. One in six of the population have made a subject access request. And they take a lot of effort to comply with. I think an average is roughly 120 to 200 hours for most organizations. So be aware of subject access requests. They become free under GDPR. And as a result, we're going to see many more subject access requests made. So what are the consequences? Well, obviously, more, um, much more to do for controllers and processors. If you don't know the difference between a data controller and a data processor, I'll give you a link to a glossary at the end where you can look it up. But in some respects, you don't need to worry about that after May because controllers and processors are treated almost equally, and both of them will have legal responsibility, as I've said, even if they're based in the US. There'll be tougher um, uh, liability and compensation provisions. Uh, the UK sort of jumped the gun there in a case called Vidal Hall, which concerns uh, Safari browsers, so that went up to the Court of Appeal. It's easier to get compensation for data breaches in the UK as a result. Uh, we found out yesterday that another Schrems piece of litigation, you might call Schrems 2, a class action against Facebook, is going to the European Court as well. So there's going to be lots of changes on liability and compensation. Expect to have to pay people if you have a data breach. In addition, there are fines, which will go up to 4% of global annual turnover for, uh, for severe breaches. So if you look at TalkTalk, Talk, for example, the Pika case uh, last week, uh, uh, don't quote me on these figures, but I think the maximum fine under Pika for Talk Talk's breach was £1,000. Under GDPR, I think it becomes 73 million. So a real difference in the, in the fine levels under GDPR. Um, as a result, I think, greater reputational risk and greater shareholder and investor engagement. A lot of the work we're doing at the moment is sitting down with the executive team, sitting down with the non-executives and telling them about GDPR so that the company can react, but also so that the company can uh, educate its own shareholders as well. Now, can I take that? You may. Thank you. So um, in many respects, though, I think GDPR is already a reality. And a lot of us are talking about what's going to happen in May 2018, ignoring the fact that some of it already has. And if you're a multinational, you'll have seen already in places like the Netherlands that we already have elements of GDPR. We have, you know, 10% of global annual turnover as a potential fine there. And the statistics are telling us that data breach reporting is happening an awful lot. As if that wasn't challenging enough, we also have a parallel piece of legislation that's sort of parallel but sort of in connected, uh, unconnected. It's going through the same journey called the NIST Directive that only applies to some circumstances, uh, some uh, um, sectors, so telecoms, financial services, payment providers, people like that. But the NIST Directive is also uh, coming through. Uh, it's important to remember that this is where this distinction between regulation and directive matters. Regulation will be law May 2018. The NIST directive will require UK legislation to put it into national law. So the uh, NIST directive may be a victim of Brexit, where I don't think uh, GDPR can be. So let's look briefly at Brexit, uh, specifically for John. Um, so will it make a difference? Well, I think the answer is yes and no. With GDPR, I don't think it makes a difference at all. Um, the analogy I used last week, so apologies if anyone heard it, is 
I don't think there's any uncertainty over the destination of GDPR. I think it's a bit like that case a couple of weeks ago of that person who got into an Uber drunk and the Uber driver drove all around the houses. We know the destination, we just don't know the journey. And so we know that GDPR will be a reality in the UK. And I can answer various detailed questions as to why that is the case. But whichever route we follow, GDPR still impacts us. Or GDPR worse. Why GDPR worse? Because already we know that some of the politicians like Jan Albrecht have said that they will object to the UK getting favored nation status because they allege, not me, that GCHQ are doing the same bad things as they say the NSA are. And as a result, the UK will have to pass an adequacy threshold. Uh, bear in mind, of course, that these same politicians have already had a fight with Theresa May over her introducing new powers. There's another case where David Davis and Tom Watson were the lead plaintiffs going to the European Court. David Davis obviously has dropped out of that litigation now that he's in the cabinet, but that case is still about to be heard and will create all sorts of turmoil around GDPR and Brexit. So you are going to have to comply with GDPR. The earliest the UK could leave is probably going to be uh, January 2019. GDPR will already be in, in May 2018. So at the very least, you've got a seven-month window where you're going to have to comply. But my, uh, my bet would be that we're going to have to introduce legislation like GDPR could still be tougher than that. The Cybersecurity Directive, I'm not so sure. That could fall by the wayside. So what should your response be? Well, first of all, obviously, have a plan. Secondly, you need a proper data breach plan as well. Like I've said, a bit like that fire evacuation process. Know what you're going to do when a breach happens. Thirdly, review your vendor contracts. I've mentioned that already. Have a look at the fine detail. You will need them to cooperate if there is a breach. Most vendors aren't geared up to giving you the data in 24 hours. That's roughly what you'll need if you're going to make a breach report in 72. Um, put in place a DPIA process. If you're responsible for data security, get a seat on that table. Uh, get your documents and records in order. There's uh, extended powers of dawn raids. They're not called that, but they look like it. So make sure that you can get hold of the documents uh, when you need them very quickly. Think of a world without employee consent. Make sure that these new rights, like data portability, right to be forgotten, are in your plans. Brief the board, very critical. Do it before you have a breach. Make sure that they know the steps you're going to take. If you, if you brief them early, you might also get better budget to do the stuff you need to do as well. Uh, train staff. Set up regular audits or reviews. I personally don't like audits. I prefer reviews, but do them regularly. And obviously, I would say, wouldn't I, sense check your plans with uh, specialist lawyers. Obviously, if you only do one, John, do the last. Um, so <laughs> I've still got kids to put through school. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so there's quite a lot of resources. I know that's been a rattle through you know, sort of 88 pages in 20 minutes, but there are some resources to help. Susie, who's at the end, who can wave, can, uh, can point you to the white paper where we expand on some of the principles that I've talked about in hopefully easy to understand language, the specific white papers for health and for financial services as well. Um, and all that remains is to say thank you for listening. Jonathan, thank you very much indeed.